Join us today as a seasoned marketing guru with decades of experience in all forms of advertising and marketing. She specializes in creative strategy, creating campaigns that drive business, sales, and mindset coaching. Her spiritual healing journey has been crucial to her success, and she is committed to sharing her struggles and helping other female entrepreneurs develop emotional strength and confidence. So guys, help me welcome our guest today, the marketing guru, the co-host, the host of a podcast show, Deals with Heels, Debra Bowers. Debra, welcome to the show. Thank you, Joanne. I'm so happy to be here. Yep. So, you know, I really enjoy our pre-chat. Um, and um, thanks for sharing your a bit of your journey and your story. What do you see as the because we talk about challenges before the interview, what do you see as the most significant um challenge that female entrepreneurs especially face today, both in business and in the marketing industry? You know, for me, I talk to a lot of women who have lost their voice and they don't know which way to go. They don't know what business they want to start. Even on some of the social media threads, I'll see um, somebody will post on there. I want to start a business and I don't know what to start. Mm -hmm. So that's like something missing with them, right? I can't choose what kind of business you should have. I can tell you what I'm doing that's successful. You can look at what somebody else is doing that's successful. But I think that you have to feel passion about it. Being self-employed is really hard work and no one's motivated every day, right? Discipline wins the day. So to, how do you get that discipline to make you want to keep doing it, to make you get up? You don't have a boss. You don't have a time to get there. You have no one with putting things on you, that expectations on you that are going to make you be disciplined. Like we're all kind of conditioned to that 40 hour work week and especially here in in the United States. So I think finding that discipline, you have to find your why, right? You have to know why am I doing this? Why is this important to me? Why did I choose this? And it took me a long time to find mine. Um, But that is the only thing that's going to be able to give you discipline. You can be motivated to make money. You can be motivated to take care of your family. You can be motivated to step away from corporate. You can be motivated by people not not liking people telling you what to do, wanting to be your own boss. But what are you going to do with it? And how are you going to stay disciplined with it? How are you going to fight for it when you're down in the trenches? Being self-employed isn't easy and the buck stops with you, how are you going to have the emotional and mental fortitude to be able to make it through all of that? And for me, and in my sales coaching business, all of that comes down to why am I doing it? And for a woman, we often get stuck in your why is, well, I'm raising my family, and I'm going to take care of my husband, and I'm going to make sure my household is put together. And I can tell everyone, 1000% your why is not to raise children. It's not to build wealth for your future generations. It's not to take care of your husband. Your why is personal to you. And it, it's why you're here. And no one comes here to reproduce. That's that's really not our, our why from our sole purpose. And for me, my why isn't sales and my why isn't marketing. My why that I do it is to help other women find their voice and to join this collective female movement to help us bring back that feminine energy to the world and helping women conquer all of that, find who they are again, step into their power and stand there in it and feel comfortable in it. And I didn't know that was my why because I had to do it myself. Mm -hmm. So until I really went all the way through it and found myself and my voice again, then I was like, okay, here it is, right? I feel so passionate about helping other women find that. That gets me up in the morning. That gets me up and makes me want to go be a better marketing person, a better salesperson, a better podcast guest, a better podcast host, and a better friend. Uh, It it really is, it it really does come down to that. I think that's a huge struggle with women. We are all so wrapped up in making sure everyone else is okay. Yeah. 
So that for me, the number one struggle female entrepreneurs is finding their own path and standing in it and not making decisions based on what's going to make other people comfortable, what's going to make other people happy, especially people we love. That's easy to sacrifice. We, I, I raised five kids. I spent a long time, a couple of decades, sacrificing because that's what we do as moms. Everyone's needs comes before yeah. our own. But you have years of experience in sales and marketing. Were you in the, in a job? Like, how did you become an entrepreneur? How did you become, you know, start your own business and start helping other entrepreneurs? You know, it it, it was a really long journey. I started out um, to straight out of college, uh, working in, in corporate America, sales and marketing. And I learned so, so, so much. Um, and it was in the 90s. So I'm going to be 58 uh, in November. So I'm older than I look, but it took me a long time to get to where I am. It was a really long journey. And and, and that's part of the reason why I, I could never find what specifically I wanted to do. And I first got married right out of college and had kids and climbing the corporate ladder and then my marriage fell apart and eventually I got remarried and he had two kids too. We had four kids under the age of seven. Wow. And if you want your four kids to not be criminals when they grow up and <laughs> to do be good, productive adults, you can't both work 60 hours a week. It, and that's what we were doing. And so I took a step back from my career and helped my husband build his businesses and mm -hmm. helped other people build their businesses and took care of my family and raised my family. And there were, as I sit now, I can look back and think to myself, gosh, if I had made this decision then, when I had this kind of uncertainty happening in my life, but truly you, when you're in that point you're making decisions based on what's best for everybody what's best on for the household you're not hey everybody's about to sacrifice because i want to go start this and although my husband did it multiple times mm -hmm. I, I never did it i never i felt this kind of outside pressure i was got into that people pleasing and I hold all of this together and I really lost sight. Now I always did marketing consulting on the side, wrote business plans and marketing plans in addition to working um, and building my, my husband's businesses. But I, I ran a construction company as CEO for a little over seven years. Um, I'm not passionate about construction, yeah. but I felt like I, you take the fastest path to being able to solve the goals for your family. It's, it's not cheap to raise four kids. And then I adopted a child that was 16 um, later. So I raised five kids and I sacrificed a lot. And I got back into marketing when my marriage fell apart. That really is where I, where I feel the best. Uh, I have a communications degree and I love marketing and building campaigns. I'm competitive. I want my customers' campaigns to do well. And I'm good at it. I'm really good at it. But I was still working for somebody else. And it really took um, my mom dying. I, I took care of my mom too. Look at all that people pleasing I just listed that I did. All the taking care of everybody else that I did for 20 years. And I wouldn't change any of it. Even the things that I'm not proud of. And there are definitely some of those um, because they brought me to the here and now. You know that lyric yeah. in that John Legend song where he says, my history brought me to this place. Yeah. That's how I feel about it. Without all, all of that, I wouldn't be sitting here right now with you. And I like it here. And I don't want to change it because what if I can't find my way back? So all of those things that I did brought me here. After my mom died, I, I lost 20 pounds. I was frail and thin. I lost all the way down to 115 pounds. And I've, I've gained all of that 
back. I, I am one of those people who gets thin and can't eat when they're have stressed out or I was grieving and I went to grief counseling and solved a whole bunch of other stuff while I was in there and um, started my agency that same year. And then a year later started my podcast and I'm just never looking back. Honestly, I feel so much. I'm more in my own skin today than I have been in 20 years. Yeah. And it feels great, but it took a look at all the, it took me so long to get here, but that is just, if you're out there and you're older, you're in your forties or me, I was in my fifties, man, don't give up. You mm -hmm. can still do it. You can still put your life together. I changed my mindset, changed my life, got healthy and it, it's possible. It, and, and in fact, you might be better at doing it now than you were when you were younger. I was so unsure of myself when I was younger and I am so much more confident now um, that I'm older in my fifties. Yeah. I'm so glad that you mentioned about your podcast because um, I want to know why did you, because I know about podcasting, why did you start your own podcast? Like what inspired you to start your own podcast? And then I will ask my next question. In the past, I would have, I don't know what, dreams or kind of um, thoughts about um, spreading my message or kind of having a podcast, but I had never really seriously sat down and said, what am I going to do? I really want to do this. And I met uh, my friend, Christina, and she was my co-host for the first two seasons, um, and I don't, we just really hit it off. She was on a very similar spiritual journey than me, even though she's almost 20 years younger than me. We had both been healing and both were in this place. And when we met, we just clicked, had mm -hmm. great chemistry. And I can't really explain why I did this, but I'd known her about three months, four months. And I asked her to start a podcast with me. And it just kind of came out. I didn't have a lot of thought that yeah. went behind it. I think it just was the universe putting everything in my path that I needed to be able to do. And for her, it was her lifelong dream to have a podcast. It was just like everything came together like it was supposed to happen. And we started brainstorming and it just organically came together and we launched about four months after that so it we both are you know even though she's quite a bit younger than me she has been in a really big growth and healing journey as well and we bonded over that and really had a common passion for empowering women Mm -hmm. and empowering women in business to help find their way and find their voice. And so it, it really happened organically and I, I didn't have to force it or um, I didn't fret over it and worry, should I do it? We just yeah. both kind of jumped in and were complete rookies. Uh, thankfully, I had, you know, been in marketing for so long that I'd done a lot of video production not editing, but I write copy and scripts and I've edited lots of TV commercials. And my first marketing job, I had an in-house TV production crew. And so I learned a lot about that. And it was uh, made things easier. I definitely podcasting kind of hits my sweet spot. I have a communications degree, not journalism, but communicating. Mm -hmm. And it, it just it just worked out really well for me, my marketing and packaging and all of those skills helped with content and planning content. Hmm. I do tend to take a, a kind of packaging look for it for topics and splitting topics. And, you know, this season, I'm going to talk about these topics and then really packaging them together in a way that it makes you you know, coming up with all the content all the time is so difficult. Uh, most podcasts fail because they run out of things to talk about, which I'm sure you can tell is not yeah. a risk for me really at this point. <laughs> but being, being able to separate and say, you know, I don't want to all talk about um, 
all sales. I don't want to talk about that all the time. I also want to talk about some female empowerment stuff and issues. And so being able to package them, make sure that I stay true to what I want that content to be. And so that helped, helped us too, that I was able to have those skills. And so now we've come to a place in the podcast where Christina is taking a step back for her uh, family um and so i'll rebranding as single host still keeping the name deals with heels but uh it's exciting to see yeah. all of the changes and it feels great to accept them and not try you know i could have very easily come in and tried to convince her not to but we have to trust each other and understand that people do what they need to do for themselves and it's not a character flaw yeah and you know, every I believe everything happens for a reason, right? I know you are spiritual, everything happens for a reason. Um, uh, maybe this is the path that you have to take. Um, this is your next, you know, step. And um, you know, it's so interesting because I again I work with so many people. I work, I help people start a podcast, and so often I hear excuses like, Who am I to start a podcast? There are so many podcasts out there, you know, do I have enough to say? Everything that you mentioned, right? So again, it's Often, so often it's only from people like females, you know, I don't hear it from men, but saw my female audience or followers who give me all these excuses of why they can't start a podcast. Um, and I think it's so closely related to what you do and how you help people, you know, it's about finding their voice and it's so important, right? Because podcasting is all about sharing your voice, sharing your message, your story. So um, I know, yes, we now establish the, the problem, right? The challenge we as female entrepreneurs, we struggle with finding our voice. Why do you think that is? Like, why is that? Mostly because we've been told to sit down and shut up for <laughs> generations yeah. and not to have an opinion. And we're not given a voice really in politics. And when we are, we're seriously criticized for mm -hmm. even having it. Um, it. It really has been a millennia of us people-pleasing gosh, you'd sure be a lot prettier if you'd smile. And all of the, um, this is the way you're supposed to be. Sit over there and, pre and be pretty and be quiet and yeah. do what your husband says and, and take care of your kids and take care of your household. And now we want you to work too because we can't make enough money for the household on top of everything else that you were doing. And we just had our voices suppressed and epigenetics is a real thing. DNA memory, you pass it down from generation to generation mm -hmm. and PTSD they've proven um, it, it makes is makes actual changes to your DNA. So if let's, let's take, it's easier to understand it from something like, um, African-Americans and slavery. I've met many, many African-Americans and they feel, and you can feel their pain and it feels like they were slaves themselves. They have deep, deep rooted pain and PTSD from it. And yet they weren't slaves. Right. And so that to me started kind of my down the rabbit hole thinking about um, and women are the same. It's harder to picture it in your mind, but think about the PTSD that that slavery would cause and the changes that that happened in your DNA. And now, well, you're not allowed to heal it because you're still a slave and now you've had kids and you've passed that down and to them. And then the same thing happens to them. And now here we are generations later where, where we're not slaves anymore, but someone in that line has to be strong enough to heal that yeah. and to fix it so yeah. that when they pass it down, that is epigenetics. That is the spreading of abuse and trauma and changes that happen in your DNA and it going down through generations. The same is true for women. It's harder to see yeah. because women don't see it themselves, mm -hmm. right? They don't know why they feel that way. Um, and oftentimes when I consult with somebody, a woman I hear where well, my husband thinks I should do this or they'll say, maybe I should do this. And it's not framed in anyone telling them, maybe they're not even married, but they'll say, but maybe I should just do this. Yeah. And you can see it. I can see it, that that's a choice 
that she's been conditioned to consider and it should be taken off the table. Mm. That's not a choice. You, you doing that is not a choice. How does that help you meet your goal? No. You don't even realize we're doing it. And it, it, it's not that it's not it's something that you could choose. You could, but is it the best for you? No. Why are you even suggesting it? And it's because we're conditioned to think we can't do it. Mm. We're conditioned to think I need help or yeah. I need permission. Yes. I need okay. someone to tell me it's okay yeah. for me to do it. Yeah. And it it's a struggle. And that is not something that we have simply because we haven't worked in 10 years because we took care of kids. That's not why that's there. That is there because of this centuries long yeah. uh, treatment of women and, you know, domestic abuse, all of the things that have made us conditioned to think this is how we're supposed to be. I personally wouldn't post something if I thought it was going to get people riled up. I wouldn't post something on social media if I was going to get a harsh reaction from somebody. I was very conditioned to not uh, not rock the boat, yeah. right? Keep everything calm, keep everything, everybody happy. That same conditioning for that I had for my family, even, even when I knew something didn't feel right, I couldn't fix it. I couldn't change it. I found out when I was in counseling, it's kind of a funny story. So I was in with my counselor, Fred, mm -hmm. and... I was really um, venting about procrastination and I'm procrastinating and I'm being really hard on myself, of course, um, about procrastinating. I don't know why I can't get things done. I, I just actually, I can't do it. I'm being so lazy. All the things that we torture ourselves with for being procrastinators. And Fred says, Deborah, you're not procrastinating. And I replied, you're not listening to me. I just explained to you how much I am procrastinating. And he said, no, you're not. You're in fight or flight. You're the deer. You're in freeze. Mm -hmm. That's why you can't fight through it. That's why you can't actually do it because you're in functional freeze. So I was not consciously or, uh, in fight or flight. I wasn't in danger. Um, and it's appropriate. It's really important that we have fight or flight as humans. It saves us. Oh, it's not appropriate for us to be in fight or flight because something reminds us of when someone was mean to us 10 years ago, or when we had something happen and we made a bad decision and it didn't turn out well. So now we're, it, it caused us to go in fight or flight that memory or because of some, epigenetic memory that we have that's causing us to go whatever that reason is i i'm not even kidding when i say i think i was in functional freeze for a decade maybe it was such a long time well, it's a function of freeze well yeah. functional freeze is it it feels for me it felt just like i was procrastinating i'm not doing a task i'm not making a decision mm. i'm not doing something that i need to do Okay. And it's, it's not that it's too difficult for me to do. Hmm. It's that I just, it, it feels almost like I'm avoiding it. I'm avoiding doing it. And when you're procrastinating, you know, that's like admin. I don't like to do a lot of admin. I'll procrastinate that and I won't do it. But this was different. This was, I can't make a decision. If I had one thing on my to-do list, that caused me to go into fight or flight subconsciously, I couldn't do anything on the entire list. It was inexplicable. I was really hard on myself about it. And once I realized that that's what it was, he gave me one grounding technique and it snaps me out of it. It changed my entire life. And I think collectively women are in functional freeze. We know something's wrong. We know it's not supposed to be like this. We know it's not supposed to feel like this. And we can't make a decision for what to do to fix it. We can't even think about making it. We can't even come up with a plan to yeah. fix it. 
we don't know why, but I just can't decide. I don't, I don't know what to do. I can't make that decision. I can't choose. Mm -hmm. And, and a good example for me, I was very, very unhappy in my marriage and I had tried to communicate. I was married 19 years. It wasn't like we were newlyweds, but I tried to communicate. And when that didn't work rather than making a decision at that point. I just chose to stay and move on and keep going through, but I never solved it. I carried that lack of decision and that lack of solution for the things that I was upset about that were valid. And I just carried all of that. And so when I needed out of my marriage, I couldn't do it. I couldn't make the decision. And then I justified that with, well, I must really love him and want to be here or I would choose to leave. Right. And so I uh, uh, sabotaged my marriage because I couldn't make that decision. Right. The universe will screw your life up royally to get you on the right path if you can't make that decision. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. It totally will. And, and it did for me. I had to have a lot of tragedy to force me to make decisions. And even then it was really difficult to do until I realized I was sitting in fight or flight, but I was the deer. And mm. I, you know, you think about fight or flight is I'm either running or I'm fighting uh, or, but no, I was like standing standing in the road, like the deer in the headlights, unable to move or make a decision. So the yeah. grounding exercise is called 54321. And you can Google it. It's um, you, it grounds you to the here and now, hmm. which is a safe place. Now, if you are not in a safe place, then I, I don't know that this will work because you may be in fight or flight and really, you know, there's a lot of people that are in in bad situations that aren't safe. So I'm not implying that, that that doesn't exist. But for me, I was in a safe place. I just was going into um, fight or flight. And so you you um, look at five things I can see, four things you can it hear, and it really awesome. grounds yeah. all of your senses to the here and now, which is safe. And it will snap me out of fight or flight. Oh. And I can do, I mean, immediately it I was shook by how well. And so that's kind of how I can tell yeah. now I don't go into fight or flight nearly as often. Um, but when I do, if I do that exercise and suddenly I can do, yeah, then I know I was in fight or flight. And I, I think that women are kind of stuck there a little bit and it's, not intentionally. Um, we've just been conditioned that way yeah. and it's tough to break through it, but boy, once you do, it's amazing how you, I, I feel like I did kind of when I was in my twenties, like I just felt like something that was holding me back was gone. And I felt like myself again, it, it, it was a beautiful thing. It changed my life. Honestly, I'm so grateful to Fred. Yeah. And that's why you are doing the work that you're doing today. And you know, you're right. I think there are so many female entrepreneurs, especially we talk about it, like people who are hesitant to start a business, start a podcast, they don't know what to do. They can't make a decision. They can't leave their job, you know, right? They can't leave a, a marriage. So, again, okay, I think we have talked enough about mindset and, you know, we, we, we established that it's important to work on your mindset. But now that's because I know my listeners, they also want to learn some of the strategies and marketing strategies, especially from someone like you with okay. your experience in advertising and marketing campaigns, um, you know, running a, a successful marketing campaign. So the first question that I have is, you know, People today, we talk about social media, you know, Instagram, TikTok, and people are posting online, uh, posting contents online. We are getting overwhelmed with contents, right? So why is it that I see so many people, especially coaches or entrepreneurs, you know, people who are trying to start a business, trying to build a momentum, trying to build a movement, sorry. And they are making tons of content online, but it's not working for them. It's not getting the, them clients and they don't know what to do. My industry, marketing, advertising, agencies, all of that has become very segmented, right? We have content creators and social media managers and digital and website design and photographers and branding photographers and all of the things. And to entrepreneurs and small business people, they look like they all do the same thing. 
Yes. And what I have found is that none of them sell anything. Hmm. So they used to always say, especially when the internet first came out, that 75, 80% of your content shouldn't have anything to do with what you're selling, right? That you should build an audience so that your audience is watching so that when you have your sales messages come in, that 25% that that's left, that's you actually promoting your business, you have all the eyeballs on you. And so they see your sales message. That's the whole point of organic content. But no one does the sales messaging. They just post and post. And yes, there are affiliate marketing and people get a bunch of followers on a platform and now they're in maybe performance bonus and they can make money on their content and 100% that is nothing but posting. That is, let's just post and post and post and post. And that's not the same thing mm -hmm. as running a plumbing business. That's not the same thing as running a retail business or even running my business or running a pot. Those, that's not the same thing. People need to, to think about that. I think really there's a, there's a huge lack of sales culture. And in corporate world, when I was running marketing departments for big companies, they were companies that were very competitive. It was a competitive industry, sometimes cutthroat industry. And as a marketing director, I was responsible for the plan, the marketing plan and the budget, but the growth that went with it as well. And so when you sit in that meeting and they're like, okay, we didn't hit our numbers this month and your ass is the one that's on the line for it, it makes you a different kind of a marketing person than a content creator. Yeah. And so I don't know how to do marketing without doing sales. I don't know how to post con. I mean, it's not, I'm not that kind of a marketing person. And, and I would argue that all marketing is about sales. And the community involvement and the public relations people are like, no, 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 no. We're not doing this to sell. And so why did you send that press release to all the TV stations? Why did you write an article about your, your community involvement and everything you do for charity? Well, we want people to know what we're doing. And why do you want them to know that? So that they think good about us. Why do you want them to think good about you? So you can sell more stuff. It's still selling, selling in a quiet voice. And so I think that we're kind of, a couple of things are causing that. One, the experts that we're dealing with are really good at what they do. They don't sell. Mm. So you have to have that. If you don't have that sales background as a business owner, then you need to get it because you can't be guaranteed that the marketing people you're hiring have it because a lot of them don't. They're simply content creators. You need to provide that message. And I think it's true. A lot of business people have sat down and they'll say, what are we going to do? We're going to post. Okay. What are you going to post? Well, what do you want us to post? Now we're back to the message again, right? So having that strategy, having that sales yourself. And then I also think that we're kind of stuck with we want to sell, but we don't want anyone to know we're selling. We want to sell, but but we don't want it to be on the on our website that we're selling. Yeah. We are so afraid of selling, you know, like asking for that sale, yes. right? We get sold every day, right? I liked your podcast. You, you got sold to have me as a guest. Maybe somebody somebody sold them coffee this morning. We buy and sell things all day long. We have a consumer-driven economy. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And yet, when it's our business... And it's the most important thing. It's the livelihood for us and our family. It is so far back on the back burner that we got to dig deep to find it. <laughs> so I think it's important to bring that sales culture front and forward in your business. There's a lot of things that can cause us to go out of business, right? We, you can overextend your operations and you can spend too much on capital. You can hire the wrong people. All of those things might cause us to go out of business. Yeah. If we don't sell our products and services, we're for sure going out of business without a doubt. Yeah. So let's bring it back up. That doesn't mean we have to be the, the car salesman here. Sell, sell, sell. Let's go, go. We, that doesn't mean we have to be doing that. That's what your business's sales culture is. 
That's mm. part of your brand. How are you going to sell things? What is your voice and your message going to be for selling? And figuring all of that out and having it be a culture throughout your business so that your frontline people know how to sell your products to your customer service people. Everything's so segmented that it's hard to get good service. And so I think bringing that sales culture is really, really important. And it's something that we've gotten away from because no one wants to be talked into buying something. I want to go. I don't want to be talked into buying some kind of foo-foo coffee drink. I want my normal. I don't want to. Everybody, it, as long as I don't feel like I made a bad decision or I got talked into buying something that I shouldn't buy, you control that culture in your business. Yeah. Right. You control how your people sell actively put that sales culture together. And now while you're doing that, your target audience, I have a lot of people that, that are like, I, we've met with several different media companies and they've all agreed that social media is our next place we need to be mm. and they're business to business. I sell to other businesses. Why would I need to be on Facebook for my business? Look how much of that's wasted. I sell to other businesses. How many percentage of people on Facebook own a business and are the buying decision person for that business? It's such a small amount. Yeah. So look at all of that content that just, just goes to the wrong people. You know, it goes to people you're never going to sell to. And that is also a function of you're going and talking to a content creator and, and their solution, like you go to a surgeon, they have a surgical solution. Yep. You go to a content creator, they have a content solution. I think that's part of it too. And it's not a, it's not a, they're, it's not that those are terrible companies. They're not, they're great companies. They make great content. Yep. It's that you need to find the one that does what you need to do and make sure you know where your customers are. You know who your customers are. So then you can decide I'm business to business. Boy, I'm going to be on LinkedIn yeah, because that's where all business people are. And there's that kind of marketing, the mm. actual marketing where we're getting into not just what your brand looks like visually, but what is it really? What are your values? And in a deeper level than loyalty. So we're going to use the color yellow. Um, it, it's more than that. It's, it's how, who are your customers? Are you going to be the low cost provider? Are you going to be middle of the road? Are you going to be the Cadillac? Those make a big difference. If you're the Cadillac, don't ever offer a discount. That target, they won't buy something if they think it's cheap and not worth it. They buy things that it, because it's always about value. Yeah. How do you make it valuable? The low cost provider is always going to have a discount and they're going to have to do a lot of volume yeah. to make the same money that these people do. So knowing all of those things about your business is important so that you can communicate them to the marketing people that uh, you're hiring. Yeah. I mean, great. This has been so great. I mean, so helpful. A lot of tips that you have shared um, with our listeners today. I'm sure there's a lot more we can talk about, but I look at the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of your time. And, you know, uh, is there anything else that you really want to share? Perhaps I didn't ask you, didn't let you. Um, of course, I'd love for everyone to check out my podcast, of course. Um, Deals with Heels, where female entrepreneurs thrive. We talk a lot about sales and marketing and mindset and business growth and all of those things. But honestly, mindset is the most important thing. It controls whatever you want to be successful in, you have to have the right mindset. And that's definitely true of sales. Sales can be discouraging and it can be frustrating. And, and especially if you're a business owner and sales isn't what you do best. So rarely it is, it can be discouraging and mindset's really, really important in my sales coaching business. Mindset's a really big part of it. And so focusing on that, and making sure you're, you're the negative self-talk that we talk to ourselves, we don't realize we're doing it. That we're not only maintaining a positive self-talk, encouraging self-talk. No one's in a good mood every day. No one's positive every day. So flow with the punches. Know that 
when an obstacle comes up, take a beat. Why is this obstacle in front of me? Maybe I'm not supposed to go that way. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the wrong way. And, and take make note of it. Have your mindset ready to evolve and be accepting of the path and pivot, right? Yeah. yeah. Entrepreneurial mindset. Oh, that didn't work. Let's go this way then and go and don't get bogged down in mm-hmm. mistakes or things that don't work. Yeah. Because yeah. that that's the mindset of yeah. negativity and failure. And so, oh, some didn't work. Okay, let's move. Let's go this way. Yeah. And move on. And that that's the best uh, mindset to have to be an entrepreneur and be able to move through things and things that are difficult without taking them personally, just knowing that, well, I learned something that didn't work today. Tomorrow, we're going to see if this one works. Yeah. And we are getting closer to our success, right? Because I mean, it's yes. a straight line and we all seen the graphic <laughs> of, like, you know, a lot of lines and um, <laughs> we have to figure it out and do it and Yes. Just so make sure you don't go backwards, right? Keep going. You can go all the different directions, but it's not negative for something not to work. That's yeah. actually something good. Now I know that's not going to work and I can figure out why it didn't yeah. and learn from it. And now you'll never do that again. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about mindset. You're right. Because 80% of, 80% of success is mindset. 20% strategies, right? I think Tony Robbins says that if I'm not wrong, yeah, or someone else. <laughs> I, I mean, it definitely is. Mindset yeah. is everything. And um, you can download, I do have a free ebook, Five Steps to a Mindset for Success. Mm-hmm. Those are the actual steps that I took to change my life. Um, so please, I'm, I included the link um, to Joanne and um, download that free book. Those are the ones it's really short, but those are the steps that I actually took when I started over and changed my life and mindsets what did it. Yeah. Incredible. Thank you so much again for coming and joining us today. I'll put all your links in the show notes below your website, your podcast, um, the, the ebook and that you just offered. Thank you so much. Thanks for being so generous with me and my listeners today. All right, guys, I hope you learned a lot from today's episode. If you have any other questions, you can leave a comment below. If you are watching this on YouTube, we'll get back to you. And remember to like and subscribe so you never miss another episode. And thanks for listening and watching today. Until next time, keep showing up. Success doesn't show up for you until you show up and pursue your own success.